Cool. Well, we'll get started then. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for having me and thank you everybody for joining. I'm very excited. This is my first talk of 2024. Um, so excited to uh, get into this with you all. Um, as mentioned, do feel free to pop questions into the chat. I will kind of keep an eye on the chat as we go through. So if you do have anything that pops up as we go on, I'll um, either answer it then or I'll save it for the end um, if I think it's going to be a bit of a longer discussion. Um, and yeah, feel free to chat with each other in the chat as well and share your experiences. So um, today we're going to be talking about uh, taking the public out of public cloud, getting started with Azure private endpoints. Um, but first, um, a little introduction to myself for those who don't know me. Uh, my name is Grace O'Haller and I'm a senior data engineering consultant uh, currently working with Advancing Analytics. Um, but I've been working with uh, building and deploying Azure data platforms for nearly six years now. Um, and I am a recently awarded data platform MVP and a Microsoft certified Azure developer and Azure administrator. Uh, my area of specialism and my, um, my interest, I suppose, um, is all around kind of Azure network security for data platforms, which you might think I'm a bit weird for having that as my, <laughs> as my interest. Um, but I think we'll, we'll touch on a bit later as to why I think in particular that's so important to, to know about as a data person. And I'd be interested to hear other people's thoughts on that as well. Um, I've popped my socials on there, so do feel free to connect with me. Um, and I've also got my blog on there where I talk about sort of networky data related things. And I've also got a GitHub for my community content. So the slides for this session will be on there, um, but I think they will be being shared anyway with you. So feel free to check that out too. So what to expect from the talk today? Um, so I've tried to uh, split it up into three main sections. We'll do a little bit of an introduction to private endpoints because I really wanted this talk to be, you know, for people who really don't have any concept of, of what they are but want to learn versus, you know, uh, and at the end being comfortable with being able to, to work with them and deploy them. So we'll spend a little bit of time making sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and then we'll move into the bulk of the session, which is my seven steps to success um, deploying and configuring private endpoints. So this is essentially just a seven step process um, that by the end of it, you should have um, a, a successfully deployed and working private endpoint. Um, so we'll go through that conceptually. We'll run through some architecture diagrams and we'll discuss all of the seven steps in detail. And then I'll jump into a demo where I'll show you <clears throat> a couple of different ways uh, of, of, of deploying the private endpoints and the various associated bits so you can actually see the seven step process in action. Um, and then at the end, I just wanted to cover a couple of common stakes to avoid things that I typically see um, when working with private endpoints. I just kind of wanted to, to share those with you. Um, so I'm looking at hoping to finish in around 65, 70 minutes. That's the plan. Um, uh, so we'll leave time for questions at the end, but certainly I'm happy to stick around for longer than that if anyone does want to um, just have a chat about anything in more detail. So do let me know. So why is this so important, right? So presumably we're all data people um, and actually if people feel comfortable doing so, I'd love to know kind of who we've got on the call in terms of your role. Um, you know, do we have data engineers, platform engineers, DBAs, that kind of thing, any architects? Um, because it'd be really interesting to, to know kind of who, who is interested in, in learning about private endpoints. I personally, as I mentioned, I'm a data engineer, but I think in the, um, <laughs> a bit of everything, yeah, aren't we all? <laughs> um, I think in the new cloud world, a lot of us, you know, basically what Olivia said, um, we uh, we end up having to do a bit of everything, right? Because the, um, the cloud enables us to do that. Um, and people say, well, um, you know, you can just go and deploy a virtual network for, you know, I want a data platform, but I want it all fully networked, please. You can just click deploy a virtual network. That's fine, right? And uh, we go, yeah, sure. And then we try and set it all up. And actually, it's a bit more complicated than that, unfortunately. So I think there's this expectation for a lot of like data engineers, architects, platform engineers these days to kind of be a lot more familiar around some of the networking components as maybe 
was previously. Um, I certainly don't come from a pure networking background at all. I've come, uh, come in solely from the data route. Um, and I think um, for me personally, having a base level foundational knowledge of how networking in Azure works um, has really, really helped me um, and saved a lot of headaches with, with my clients. Um, and certainly private endpoints are kind of like the big thing at the moment when, when deploying a privately networked uh, data platform. So I think it's just a really important thing to at least be aware of. And as we'll go through the talk, you'll notice that some of the bits are not things that you would be doing anyway. It might be a central networking and infra team that's actually doing the configurations for you, but knowing enough to be able to ask them to do the right thing or ask them relevant questions is, is so useful, I've found. So kind of just wanting to share that knowledge with you all. It sounds like we've got quite a lot of a range within the chat, which is always interesting to see. Um, so yeah, hopefully everybody finds it useful. So as I said, I want to do a little uh, introduction to, to endpoints and private endpoints, just so we're all on the same page, but I won't spend too long on this bit. So when we're talking about an endpoint in general, taking it right back to basis, what are we actually talking about? Um, so essentially an IP endpoint, which is the kind of the type of endpoint that we're going to be focusing on today, refers to a unique network address that identifies a specific device or application on a network. So you can think of it as a literal uh, address um, that identifies your house on a street or in a, in a town. OK, it's just identifying a particular um, device within a network. An endpoint is composed of an IP address and a port number. However, we're not really going to talk about port numbers um, in today's talk. That's a bit beyond the scope. But essentially, if you think of the IP address as the location, the port number is kind of the mode of delivering uh, the, the communication, right? Because this is all about communication. The combination of the IP address and the port number creates a unique endpoint that can be used for communication and data transfer between devices over a network. So for example, you could have a physical address and the mode of communication would be sending letters or you could have like an email address and the mode of communication is sending emails. That's kind of IP address and port number, but we're not going to focus too much on port number today. So public versus private endpoints then, what's going on there? You've probably heard some of you may be familiar with Azure private endpoints already. Those who aren't familiar, you might have heard the words public and private endpoints being floated around and not really sure what they're referring to. So we're specifically talking about Azure, right? And we're, what we're really talking about is Azure PaaS services. Um, so we're talking about services that um, Azure provide for us that we can sort of build on top of. They're providing the platform components and we're building on top of them. So that means in order to make use of those services, Azure needs to provide endpoints for those different services that we can interact with, yeah? Um, and so all Azure PaaS services um, or all Azure PaaS resources that provide a multitude of different services by default have a bunch of endpoints associated with them. The example that I'll use a lot throughout this presentation is Azure uh, storage account. Right, that is an Azure resource, and there are a bunch of different services that it provides. It's got a blob service, it's got a file service, it's got a web service, it's got um, a table service, a queue service, right? And each one of those different services has by default an endpoint associated with it, a URL. Um, which is mapped to an IP address. Um, but by default, all of these endpoints that Microsoft provides you with are public endpoints, right? And so that means um, that's a different concept to a private endpoint. And really the main difference between the two, literally speaking, is a public endpoint is represented by a public IP address and a private endpoint is represented by a private IP address. Um, so public IP addresses are globally unique and so for all Azure services, there's a bunch of um, predefined IP addresses, public IP addresses, and you can find those IP addresses online. Um, for private endpoints, you don't get private endpoints by default with Azure services. You have to deploy them yourselves. Private IP addresses are locally unique. So you have to kind of create your own 
uh, network to, to put a private endpoint in, which we'll go into more detail uh, in a bit. But essentially, the main difference being there that private endpoints are represented by private IP addresses, which are only locally unique within your private network. So why does that mean it's more secure? So it probably what I've said already has given you a flavour as to why private is more secure than public. Certainly the word private feels more secure than the word public, right? Um, but let's kind of actually break it down. So when people ask you, well, why do I need private endpoints? What am I gaining from it? Well, this is the difference. So with a public endpoint, the location information of your endpoint is publicly available. So as I mentioned, you can find a list online on the Microsoft website of every public IP address associated with every single Azure service in every region. That's publicly available information. And then once someone gets hold of that IP address, that is then resolvable from the public internet. So anybody can navigate to that IP address and find the associated URL. And we'll talk about DNS in more detail in a bit. Furthermore, not only can that location information be found, by default, anyone can then actually get in. So you can think of this as I can look up the address of my favorite restaurant on Google Maps. And when I get there, I can walk in. Nothing, nothing, no one's stopping me from going into that restaurant, right? There's publicly available information and I have access, which isn't very secure. Now, another option that I wanted to just mention, because we will touch on this later on, is kind of a halfway between a public endpoint and a private endpoint, in a way, uh, from a security point of view. You may have seen this option on some of your Azure resources. Um, it's an option that says selected networks and selected networks and IP addresses enabled or something. It's slightly different on every resource, but um, and essentially. What this means is you're still using the public endpoint, right? So the location information is publicly available. So for example, um, I can look up the address of, I don't know, um, a bank headquarters or something like that. It's publicly available information. But the difference here is we're restricting access to only selected networks and IP addresses. So this is kind of like guest list only, right? So I could turn up to the bank headquarters, but they're probably not going to let me in because I don't work there. So this is more secure than the public endpoint uh, with no restrictions, but that location information is still publicly available. So the difference with a private endpoint is the location information of that endpoint is not publicly available. And even if someone were to get hold of the private IP address associated with my endpoint, it's not resolvable from the public internet anyway. So you can only access that IP address from within the private network itself. So essentially what private endpoints do is they bring an endpoint into your own network. So it's kind of like having a portal. Um, it's kind of like if I had a door in my house that went straight into the bank headquarters, right? It's bringing the bank headquarters into my house. So at no point am I having to leave the safety of my home. It's the same with your network traffic. If you create a private endpoint, you're bringing that service into your own network. So at no point does your network traffic have to leave your private network and at no point does it go over the internet. So you can see why that's so much more secure than going over the public internet. Any questions so far? No questions at this moment. Brilliant, cool. Okay, so on to the bulk of the talk then. Um, the seven steps to success. Um, so this is just something I made up, so you probably haven't seen this before, um, but I do find it very useful. Um, and I do have a blog um, written based on this talk that I'll share at the end that, that goes over the seven steps again, should you want to uh, reference them. Um, I'm going to flash up the seven components, but I'm not going to go into any detail just now because we'll go through each one um, as we go along. So step one is the private endpoint resource. Step two is the coupled Azure resource. Step three is the target sub resource. Step four is a virtual network, which is where we get our IP address from. Step five is a private DNS zone. 
resource. Step six is an A record and step seven is a virtual network link. Now, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by any if you don't know what any of those things are. As I said, we will go through all of them. Some of you may be familiar with some of those, but not all of them. Um, but I promise we're going to be confident on all seven by the end of this talk. <laughs> um, it might sound like a lot of things that, that are needed, and unfortunately, it is a bit it is a bit faffy, right? Setting up setting up your own networking. Um, <clears throat> but hopefully, by the end of this, you, with a bit more clarity over the different processes, you'll see it's actually not too bad. I don't think anyway. <laughs> Not as bad as it sounds now. <laughs> so, step one then, the private endpoint itself. So we've talked a little bit about what a private endpoint is in the context of Azure, but I just wanted to reiterate that a private endpoint is its own resource. It is a resource that you have to deploy. And when you deploy a private endpoint resource, it also uh, deploys a network interface card, a, a NIC, which is just a thing that Azure deploys for anything that requires an IP address, basically. So the IP information is held within the NIC, but you don't really need to worry about that. Um, so step one is you actually have to deploy a private endpoint resource in your own kind of you know resource group that you are responsible for. Step two is the coupled Azure resource. So deploying a private endpoint, you can't deploy a private endpoint without connecting it to another resource. It has to exist in connection to another resource because you have to tell Azure what resource you want to use the private endpoint for, right? Makes sense. So in this example, we're gonna use a storage account. But if you remember what I said earlier about the different services that resources can provide, unfortunately, Coupling it to a, an Azure resource isn't enough. It also needs what Azure calls a target sub-resource. And the sub-resource type is essentially the service that you want to use, uh, replace the public endpoint with the private endpoint for. So with a storage account example, you have your blob, your DFS, your web, your queue, your table, and there's another one that I can't think of. <laughs> um, endpoints, you have all those endpoints, uh, different services that are provided by the storage account. So in this example, I'm gonna say, well, I wanna use this private endpoint for the blob um, service. And if you also wanted to use private endpoints for the, or private connectivity for the table service, you'd need to create a private endpoint for the table service too. So you might have many private endpoints associated with one resource and that's fine. Um, but you would only have one for each sub resource type. So in this example, we're going to use blob. Now, as I mentioned before, a, a private endpoint essentially is an IP address at its core. So um, because this private endpoint is inside your network, that's what we're using it for. You need to bring your own VNet essentially to the to the table. So you need to you can create the VNet as part of the deployment, but um, I'd recommend already having the VNet created. You basically tell when you're deploying the private endpoint, you tell Azure which VNet, which virtual network you want the private endpoint to sit in and also which subnet. But you don't tell it a specific IP address. Essentially, Azure will just pick one for you um, from the subnet that you've selected or that you've specified. So this is steps one to four, um, and we've covered steps one to four quite quickly because they're all related to each other. Um, they're all related to the actual deployment of the private endpoint resource. And in fact, you won't be able to deploy a private endpoint resource unless you give it a couple Azure resource, a target sub resource and a virtual network. So you can't really get too far <laughs> without doing these things. And especially if you're deploying it in the portal, as you'll see in the demo, it prompts you for all of these things. What I would say, though, is if your private M if you've deployed a private endpoint and it isn't working, it's definitely worth checking these three things to check that you've given it the right information. Yeah. So you might have accidentally selected the queue sub resource type instead of blob and you're trying to access the blob endpoint and it won't let you in. And you think, oh, I've done everything right. Why can't I get in? Double check that you've got the right target sub resource, for example, or double check you linked it to the right storage account and it wasn't a different storage account over there somewhere. Um, just having a read of this question. 
so it's similar. I don't have experience with Redis, but it's similar with Databricks uh, VNet injection. Um, so both VNet injection and private endpoints are essentially bringing things into your own VNet, right? Um, but VNet injection is actually deploying the actual service inside your own area, whereas a private endpoint is kind of just creating a doorway to a service that's hosted somewhere else if that makes sense. Um, with a private endpoint, you can still enable public access as well. Um, so you can, I would recommend turning that off <laughs> if you're using, if you're wanting to use a private endpoint, but certainly you can still allow public access as well as having the private endpoint as well. But I think if you're inside the network, it will default to the private endpoint. So I'm not sure you have too much control over that unless you physically routed the traffic a different way. Hopefully that answers the question, but feel free to pop back in the chat if it doesn't. Um, so, cool, thank you. So that's sets one to four. Unfortunately, sets five, six, and seven are going to take a little bit longer to go through. Those are the more complex ones. Um, and a lot of the time, people will fall into the mistake of doing steps one to four because that's what's included with when you actually, you know, deploy a private endpoint resource and that's what it prompts you to put in. You put all of these things in and then you try and access your endpoint and you can't get in. And you go, well, I've you know, I've deployed my private endpoint resource, I've given it all the information it needs. And unfortunately, um, just doing this isn't enough. And that's because of our dear friend, DNS, um, which I'm sure everybody knows and loves. <laughs> um, it's certainly the source of most of my headaches. Um, so for anyone who isn't aware, DNS stands for Domain Name System. And I like to think of it as kind of like a huge phone book for the internet. Um, which I probably won't be able to use that analogy forever because people might not know what I'm talking about, but hopefully everybody on the call is familiar with a physical phone book. Um, so I like to think of it like a huge phone book for the internet that lives in the sky. It's pub so we're talking about public DNS at the moment um, and essentially it allows us to map between IP addresses and domain names, so URLs. Um, why is this important? Well, because computers communicate with IP addresses, but humans communicate with... Um, <laughs> humans communicate with language, with, with domains, right? Um, if you want to go to Google, you're not going to type in the IP address of Google, you're going to type in www.google.com, yeah? But, it, but the computer doesn't know anything about that, it needs an IP address. So we basically need a system for mapping between IP addresses and domain names, and that's what DNS servers allow us to do. And there is a public DNS service that we all use every time we use the internet. Um, Azure has its own DNS service, um, which reaches out to the public DNS servers. So when you make DNS requests, which we'll come on to shortly, um, that will go to the Azure DNS service and that will then go out to the public DNS server. But if we want to override this information, uh, sorry, if we want to override this behavior and keep our DNS private, there's some additional steps again required to set up to make that happen. So let's have a look. Um, well, that brings us on to step five, which is the private DNS zone. But before we go into detail on what a private DNS zone is, I just want to show you that kind of public DNS journey in a little bit more detail. So let's say we have our storage account um, and there's me <laughs> or you. Uh, and I want to navigate to the blob endpoint of the storage account. Um, so as I said, I'm a human, <laughs> so I'm going to type in uh, I'm going to go to my client, let's say I've got a VM in Azure, and I'm going to go to the browser and I'm going to type in the domain. As I said, the VM doesn't know what the hell to do with my storage account.blob.core.windows.net. It goes, what the hell is this? Don't know what to do with this. So it initiates a DNS query, and that DNS query will be sent initially to Azure provided DNS, which lives at that 168 um, address. So if you ever see that IP address knocking about, that is Azure DNS. And it goes, what do I do with this domain? And in a public setting, um, Azure DNS sends that to one of its many Azure DNS resolvers, and that gets sent out to a public DNS server. And that public DNS server will look through the phone book and it'll say, oh, my storage account.blob.core.windows.net, you want to go to 40.68.176.16. And that is a genuine public IP address associated with the West Europe region of, of the blob storage endpoints. There's many, obviously, there's not going to be just one IP address, but depending on where you are, it will give you a slightly different one. That was one of the ones I just picked. Um, and that gets sent all the way back down to the client and the client goes, oh, 40.68.176.16, why didn't you say so? I know where that is. 
and it takes you to the endpoint, the blob endpoint of your storage account. So that's the importance of DNS when we're talking about IP addresses and endpoints here. If that solution wasn't in place, there would be no way for the VM to translate between what I'm telling it and where it actually needs to go. So that's public DNS. Um, so how do we adapt this in Azure to work in a private DNS setting with private endpoints? So uh, that's where Azure private DNS zones come into play. And there are other solutions as well. There's now an Azure PaaS DNS offering called uh, Private DNS Resolver. Um, but the simplest way and the most common way that I've seen is using Azure private DNS zones. Now, what are Azure private DNS zones? They are, again, another Azure resource that you have to deploy. But these are global resources, so they're not tied to a specific region and they are expected to be centralized. What I mean by that is if you're working in a traditional hub and spoke topology where you have a central hub network that manages all the inbound and outbound access to your whole Azure estate, and then you have spoke networks coming off that to house your different environments, your different solutions and platforms. Um, that would mean that your private DNS zones are expected to live in the hub and you would have a central set of private DNS zones that are shared by everybody. And we'll touch on that in the very last section. What you need to know, the implication that this has for us is largely we probably won't be responsible for deploying private DNS zones. It's probably going to be a central networking or infrastructure team that deploys them and manages them. But certain integration with a private DNS zone is required when creating any new private endpoint. So if you're creating new private endpoints, you need to know what's required so that you can go and tell the networking infra team, hey, I need X, Y, Z because I've deployed some new private endpoints. Um, and you can think of an Azure private DNS zone as essentially a private phone book, kind of like the contacts list in your phone compared to the public phone book. Yeah. Um, I can't use your guys's phone and private contacts list um, to look up your friend's information, um, your friend's phone numbers, because I don't have access to it. Similarly, um, you guys can't use my phone to look up my friend's information because you don't have access to it. But it's still just a list of mappings similarly to the public DNS server, right? Um, before I move on, it, can everybody still hear me okay and see my screen okay? My Teams is playing up. We can still hear, hear you, yeah. And we can still see your screen as well. Okay, perfect. It was just doing all sorts of weird things, so I just wanted to double check. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Cool. Let me get the chat back up. Um, cool, so let's have a look at how this uh, private DNS zone, how we can slot this into our kind of architecture here and how this changes the DNS query journey. So we have a similar setup to what we had before and actually legs one, two and three of this DNS query journey are the same. I still go to the VM. I still type in the domain, it still gets forwarded to Azure provided DNS and that still gets sent out to one of the Azure DNS resolvers. However, the difference in this scenario is we're now working in a private setting. So that means my storage account is in a VNet. And crucially, when people say, oh, it's in a VNet, what they mean is I've assigned a private endpoint to this endpoint of this storage account the IP address of which belongs to this VNet. But obviously that's a mouthful to say, so nobody says that, but just be aware that that's what that means essentially. So we put this storage account in a VNet. Um, my VM is also in the VNet, so I, I know I have access to this endpoint. So what happens here in a private DNS setting is when it gets to the Azure DNS resolver, when the DNS query gets to the Azure DNS resolver, the Azure DNS resolver says, ah, you're looking for my storage account .windows.net. you actually need to redirect your query and go to my storage account .private link .windows.net. That's the private link version of the endpoint that you're trying to reach. Little side note, you may have heard people talking about Azure Private Link. Azure Private Link is essentially the, the technology that underpins Azure Private Endpoints. So when we talk about private link has become available for Databricks. We're sort of talking about the technology in general, but 
actually for Databricks, there's three different private endpoints, you, you know, different types of private endpoints that you can deploy. So the private endpoint is like the actual thing that you deploy and private link is the technology that underpins it all. Just some people often ask me the difference between those two. So just wanted to clarify. So we get redirected, our DNS query gets redirected and we're now looking for the IP address associated with this new domain. And what happens is Azure provided DNS then sends the DNS query to a private DNS zone and it looks for a private DNS zone, DNS zone with a name that matches the domain, right? So the, the, the domain is privatelink.blob.core.windows.net and so it looks for a private DNS zone called privatelink.blob.core.windows.net. This is then a private phone book and this is going to return the private IP address associated with the uh, private endpoint. So it goes, ah, my storage account .private link .blob .core .windows net. you need to go to 10.0.0.8. And again, that gets sent back down to the client. The client goes, I know where that is, and it takes you to 10.0.0.8. And at no point did your traffic between your VM and your storage account leave the private network, and at no point did your DNS query leave Azure private DNS. So that's what happens in a private DNS setting with an Azure private DNS zone. So, um, quick extra little piece of information um, that's important to note. As I mentioned, the private DNS zone has to have, an, have the name that is associated with the domains that it covers. So this private DNS zone is specifically for blob and it covers that domain. But you're likely going to be using, let's say you're deploying a data platform, you can have a bunch of different services in there that you might want to protect by private endpoint. When we deploy private, uh, when we deploy data platforms, we typically use about between like 10 and 12 private endpoints. Um, and so you will need a bunch of different private DNS zones for each different type of endpoints that you're using. So for blob, there's a blob one, for key vault, there's a key vault one, for SQL databases, there's a database one. Um, and again, you would expect your networking and infra team to have a set of these that covers kind of all of the resources, all of the services in your hub environment. But as I mentioned, Databricks private link became generally available last year and a lot of people haven't been using it. So some of my clients have been wanting to upgrade to use it. And so I've had to go and check with the networking team hey, do we already have a private DNS zone for Databricks? Because it's a new type of DNS zone that they've made. And it's called privatelink.azuredatabricks.net. And nine times out of 10, they say, no, we don't have that one because why would they? They haven't been using it. So it's always important to check <laughs> that the private DNS zones that you need are in existence, especially if you're using like a new technology, a new service that maybe isn't being used within the rest of the business. Where do you find out the what they need to be called? There's a link. Um, there's a list of them in the Microsoft documentation. Um, I have this bookmarked because I'm a loser, <laughs> um, but it's definitely a helpful resource if you're going to be working with private endpoints. And I'll provide the link again at the end, but feel free to take a screenshot of this. Um, but yeah, there's basically just a huge table in the documentation that if you look up the sub resource type that you're interested in, it'll tell you what the associated private DNS zone needs to be called. So going back to our architecture then. So unfortunately, um, oh, brilliant. Thanks for sharing that. Um, unfortunately, as you may have noticed, because we're only on step five out of seven, unfortunately, deploying the private DNS zone itself is not sufficient to actually complete this successful DNS query. There's two components that I've kind of glossed over for now um, that will um, make up step six and step seven. Um, so the first piece of extra config required is going to explain, well, how does this private DNS zone, how did it know to return 10.0.0.8? Well, the answer is it, it, it doesn't by default. Yeah, um, it literally is like an empty contacts list in your phone. When you deploy it, it's just empty. You have to populate it with information. Um, and that's where a records come in and that's step six. So let's discuss what an A record is. Um, 
So an A record, um, well, DNS records in general are instructions that live in the DNS servers on how to handle DNS queries for a particular domain. So when the servers receive that request, that's the information inside that tells it what to do or what to return. There are lots of types of DNS records, but A records in particular, which are the ones that you'll mainly be handling when working with private endpoints, a records contain a domain's associated IP address. So this is literally the mapping between an IP address or multiple IP addresses and a fully qualified domain name. So in this example, you'll see in the demo when we create the A records, it's very simple object. It's literally just a record. <laughs> um, and you tell it the type of record, type of DNS record, A, the domain which we've got here and then the IP address 10.0.0.8 in this instance. Once that A record has been populated in the private DNS zone, any queries that get sent to that private DNS zone looking for that domain, the DNS zone will know, it'll look up that domain name, it'll find the IP address and it'll know that that's what it needs to return. So really crucial that whenever you deploy a new private endpoint, you need to make sure that an A record is also added to the relevant private DNS zone. And we'll talk through a few different ways of doing that in the demo. But a lot of the time when your private endpoints aren't working, it's because you're missing an A record. <laughs> so worth knowing about. Um, a little side note, not something you need to be aware of, but just something that I found out as I was putting this talk together and I thought it was interesting. So I thought I would share it, but feel free to <laughs> ignore it in one ear out the other if you want. Um, there is another DNS record at play in this situation um, and essentially this is all to do with, basically this was a question I asked myself when I was putting this talk together. I thought well when the query gets sent out on part three of this journey to the Azure DNS resolver, how does the Azure DNS resolver know to you know reroute that DNS query and keep it private as opposed to just sending it out to the public DNS server. And I didn't know the answer to that question, so I did a bit of digging. And essentially what happens is, whenever you create a private endpoint resource in Azure, Azure will automatically add a DNS record for you in their Azure DNS resolvers called a CNAME record. And a CNAME DNS record essentially is like a forwarding rule. It maps one domain to another domain. And so as soon as you deploy a private endpoint, Azure goes, ah, I need to tell my resolvers that if any DNS requests come for this domain, I need to reroute that DNS query to the private version of that domain. Um, not something you need to be aware of, not something you need to configure at all. You won't have access to the Azure DNS resolvers. Just in case you were wondering how that worked, that's how it works. So, um, the second piece of configuration required relating to the private DNS zone, which is um, step seven, you'll be pleased to know, um, is related to how does this VM even have any awareness of this private DNS zone, right? Because you could theoretically have many of these private DNS zones deployed. I wouldn't recommend it. As I said, they're meant to be centralized and we'll talk through why at the end, but there's nothing stopping you. So how does it know which DNS zone is the one that has the IP address in it that it needs? And again, the answer is it doesn't. You need a bit of configuration to tell it. And so that is called a VNet link or a virtual network link. So what is a VNet link? Um, well, as I kind of mentioned, by default, VNets are not aware of private v DNS zones. And so that means that any client inside that VNet can't use those zones to look up IP address because it doesn't have any awareness of it. So we have to explicitly connect VNets to private DNS zones. And this is called VNet link. Once a VNet is linked to a private DNS zone, any client within that VNet can then successfully send DNS queries to that zone. So crucially, this step is less about the destination, the private endpoint, and more about the source. It's where are you accessing the private endpoint from? Anywhere where you're initiating a request to access the private endpoint, you need to make sure those source VNets are linked to your private DNS zones which again, probably not something you will be doing, but if you deploy a new VNet, you need to make sure you're telling your central networking and infrastructure team, hey, I have a new VNet, I'm gonna be wanting to resolve private endpoints from this VNet, can you add it as a VNet link to all of the private DNS zones so that I can do that, yeah? 
So essentially, um, we add this VNet link uh, onto the private DNS zone for this particular VNet. And then that means anything inside that VNet, such as RVM, is then able to send DNS queries to that private DNS zone. So another really, really tiny thing to check <laughs> if your private endpoints aren't working, check you've got the VNets. Where am I trying to resolve this private endpoint from? And it might be that you're able to resolve your private endpoint from some places and not from other places. So that might give you an indication that some VNets are linked and other VNets are not linked. So quick recap on our seven steps. So as I kind of alluded to, steps one to four are kind of all related and then steps five, six and seven are kind of all related. So step one, we've got our actual private endpoint resource that we need to deploy. We need to tell it what the coupled Azure resources that we want to connect it to. What do we want to use it for? Furthermore, we need to tell it the target sub resource types so of which actual service of that resource do we want to use the private endpoint for? And then we also need to have a virtual network and, and provide that upon deployment of the private endpoint so that it can get its IP address, its private IP address. Step five, we need a private DNS zone resource for this specific type of private endpoint. If you're deploying multiple private endpoints, you may need multiple private DNS zones. You need an A record um, and you need a virtual network link. And those are both things that are related to the private DNS zone. So the A record is something that you put in the private DNS zone, kind of like you would put a secret into a key vault. And a virtual network link is actually like a prop, it's like a setting on the private DNS zone itself. So we're at about the 40 minute mark. So I think we're doing all right for time. Um, so we're gonna jump into a demo now. Um, and I'm gonna show you a couple of different ways of deploying private endpoints in the portal. And we'll go through each of the seven steps. Um, and yeah, again, feel free to ask questions as we go. So let me see, can you now see the Azure portal on my yeah. screen. Yeah, Perfect. we can. Brilliant, thank you. So what I've got here is quite a simple, um, let's move that, quite a simple resource group. It looks more complicated than it is. Essentially, I've got a resource group where I've deployed a virtual network. And then inside that virtual network, I've plopped a, a VM. So the network security group um, and the public, you know, the disk, the public IP address and the network interface is all just related to that VM. Uh, the only reason it's got a public IP address is so that I can RDP into it for purposes of the demo. <laughs> um, but obviously in real life, you probably wouldn't have that. Um, the reason for the VM is I'm going to show you once we've set up the private endpoints that we can't get into the resources anymore from the public browser. But if I log into my VM, which is inside the private network, then I can get in. So that's what we're aiming for. Then I simply just have two resources that I've deployed, which we're going to work with, which is the storage account and the key vault. So I'm going to we're going to play around with creating some private endpoints for those different resources. Um, so I'm in the public um, browser at the moment. I'm also logged into my VM here. So I'll try and make it clear when I'm in the VM versus when I'm not in the VM. But if it gets confusing at any point, just jump into the chat and let me know um, because I appreciate that's a bit confusing. Um, at the moment, I'm outside of my VM. Um, but if we have a look at my storage account, which is what we'll start with, um, all of your networking information is under this networking pane here, under security and networking. And you'll see on this first page here, firewalls and virtual networks, this first tab, under public network access, I have enable from all networks, right? So if I go into my containers here, I can get into my containers and I can see my data, um, you know, and I can even uh, read what it says, yeah not very secure. So what we're going to do before we do anything else is I'm going to hit disabled on public network access. And you'll see it also even prompts you, please create a private endpoint connection to grant access. So even is reminding us of what we need to do. So we're going to go ahead and uh, turn that to disabled. Um, the second um, the second pane, yeah, I'll address that uh, cost point at the end. Um, the second tab on this page is your private endpoint connections, right? And um, this is where we're going to create our private endpoint from. Now, a private endpoint, as I said, is just a resource. So you can create it from anywhere, um, but I'm gonna create it from 
the resource that I want to use it for because sometimes it will pre-populate some of the information for you. So I'm going to go ahead and click create a private endpoint. Um, it's got the subscription and the resource group correct. Um, I'm going to give it a name and you'll see, as I mentioned earlier, it's also going to create a network interface card for me. I've got it in the right region. Um, and then you'll see on the next, so that's step one, we've started to create a private endpoint resource. Now you'll see the next thing, step two is already populated for us. Because I created the private endpoint from the storage account, it's recognized that and said, okay, the, res the couple de jour resource that you want to use this for is um, the storage account, this, this particular demo storage account. Step three, we need to know what the target sub resource is. So in this instance, we're going to do blob because it was the blob container that we wanted to um, protect. Um, then step four is the virtual network. So this is not the correct virtual network. So I'm just going to change it to the right one and the correct subnet. So you'll see I've got two subnets in this virtual network. One has my VM in it. So I'm going to put my private endpoints in the other subnet which is this one. So that's steps one to four. And you'll see, like what I mentioned earlier, you can't get too far without populating those things. But always worth double checking that you entered the correct values if your private endpoints are not working. Now, the next step is it actually has a DNS bit, a DNS part when deploying a private endpoint, right? Um, and this didn't used to be here when this first became available. So this is much better now. Um, so in this example, um, you'll see that it ha gives me the option integrate with private DNS zone. Now, what it means when it says integrate with private DNS zone, and I kind of wish they'd change the wording. What it means is, do you want me to add an A record for you in a private DNS zone? So it's talking about step six. And what you'll notice is if I tick yes, it's recognized the name of the private DNS zone that I need for this particular type of private endpoint. And it recognizes that I don't have one. I don't have access to any of them. Um, so it's going to say new here. So it's, it's basically saying, if you do want me to add an A record for you, at first, I need to actually deploy a private DNS zone for you because you don't have one. So um, the integration step here will actually cover step five and six for us as part of this deployment. So I'm going to head, going to go ahead and take yes for now. And then we'll do another few examples showing you a few different ways of, of, of approaching this. But for now, we're just going to say, yep, yeah, create me a private DNS zone, add an A record there for me. So I'm going to go ahead and set that off deploying. And then I'll have a look at some of the questions in the chat. Um, yeah, so, I mean, can you explain the reason why some people use on-prem DNS rather than private DNS as an assure? I've also seen people use conditional forwarding on DNS as well. If I have two domain controls in Azure, I guess I could use both, but less work to use Azure DNS so you're trying to, yeah, so it's a very, a very complex question, <laughs> but, but yeah, essentially, on-prem DNS won't work for Azure domains. So you will need, if you, if you need a solution, which many people do, which links your on-prem estate to your Azure estate, you do need a DNS solution that can tie it all together. So that's where things like conditional forwarding comes in, where you can forward requests from your on-prem domain controllers to your Azure domain controllers, and then your Azure domain controllers can choose to send things to the private DNS zones. So if you're wanting to use both, and especially if you're going the other way, so you might need to resolve um, private endpoint domains from on-prem, and you might need to resolve on-prem domains from Azure. So that's where the forwarding comes in, because it does need two different domain controllers to handle the different DNS queries. So you need to make sure that you're sending the DNS query to the right place to be able to handle it. So private DNS zones can only be used as far as I'm aware. But you can use them for custom domains, but you can't use them for on-prem domains as far as I'm aware. I am not a DNS expert, so don't hold me to that one. Um, but essentially, yeah, that's why it gets so complex, right? Because you need to make sure everything is talking to the right place. Good question. Um, 
on the costs, I will link the costs in the chat. Um, they're not that expensive, really. Um, you pay per private endpoint, but it's it's very cheap. Um, this is the that's in dollars that one, um, and you also pay for the amount of data processed in and out of your network. But again, it's very cheap per hour. It's usually quite a negligible cost. I did a cost estimate for a client where it was sort of coming out as like eleven pounds a month or something like that. Um, so I've, I've never come across a situation where it's been a deal breaker. Cool, so let's have a look at what's been deployed. Um, so if we go back to our resource group, um, you'll see that we have a bunch of stuff deployed. So we have a private DNS zone that's been deployed, our blob one. We have a private endpoint resource that's been deployed and we'll see we've got another network interface card associated with that private endpoint. So I'm gonna just show you what it looks like on the storage account first. So if we go back to our storage account and go to networking, and actually what I'll show you first is because we turned this to disabled, I just wanna to prove to you that we can no longer get in from the public internet, right? So we've disabled that. So I'm, I can't get in from there anymore. But if I go to the networking page and we go back to the private endpoint connections, you'll see that the private endpoint connection has been added here. And then there's a hyperlink to take me to the actual private endpoint resource. So if we have a look at the private endpoint resource, the overview page is quite simple, but it does give us those key pieces of information at the top, right? It tells us what the resource is that we've coupled it to. It tells us what the target sub resource is, and it tells us what virtual network and subnet we've we've attached so like i said before if your private endpoint isn't working come and have a look on here and just check that you've put the right things for all of those um the pane that's going to be the most interesting one for you is here so underneath settings you want to come to dns configuration uh, and this is where we can check some parts of our dns configuration so um what you'll notice here at the bottom is we have a essentially a mapping between the fully qualified private link domain name and the IP address and it's linking us to the private DNS zone. So the fact that this exists on my private endpoint DNS configuration pane lets me know as a data engineer that an A record does exist in a private DNS zone. Why is that useful and why is that important? Well as I mentioned earlier you probably won't have access to the private DNS zone, right? If they're a central part of your DNS solution, you probably won't have access to them. So if you're trying to check, you know, if you're trying to debug why your private endpoint isn't working, it's not like you can just go to the private DNS zone and see whether there's an A record there. So having this DNS configuration here is really helpful as a debugging tool, because if I see this here, I know I have an A record and that gives me peace of mind. But in this example, we're pretending that we do have access to the private DNS zone and we'll do another example where we don't. So let's have a look at the private DNS zone. As I said, really simple resources, just a list of records. Um, the record at the top with the at symbol, that is like a default record that just makes it work. That will be in all private DNS zones. But you can see here um, underneath, there is an A record for my storage account. And if I click onto it and just toggle this off, you'll see that it's essentially, it's an A record and it's linking my domain to my IP address. Just as we said, nice and simple. Uh, so we've got steps one to four covered. We've got step five, which is our private DNS zone. We've got step six, which is our A record. The seventh thing that we need to check is our VNet link. Um, so if I go back to the private DNS zone, and I know there's a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll come to those at the end of this little um, demo, if that's okay. Um, if we go back to the private DNS zone and underneath settings, remember I said virtual network links are a setting. Go to the settings. Ah, look at that, we have a virtual network link. So what's happened here is because I deployed the private DNS zone itself as part of the private endpoint deployment, Azure has helpfully said, well, you're deploying a private endpoint into this network, so you're probably gonna want to be able to resolve the private endpoint from that network too. So because I'm deploying a private DNS zone for you, I'm gonna go ahead and add a VNet link for you. So that's super helpful but also a bit sneaky as, and sometimes it does this and in other situations, as you'll see in the rest of the demo, it doesn't do this. So it's definitely, definitely, definitely always worth checking that the right VNet links exist. Also, this has only added a VNet link for 
that one v-net. I might have other v-nets that I plan on peering to this v-net or v-nets that, you know, facilitate on-prem access if I want to connect to my private endpoints via an express route or all sorts of situations. So you might have five or six or seven v-net links on here, yeah? So just having this one might not be sufficient. So always worth thinking about where do you want to resolve your endpoints from? How many different places? How many VNet links do I need? But in this example, nice and helpful, it's deployed everything for us. Now I will say DNS can sometimes take a little while um, to um, update. It can be up to like an hour or so. Hopefully that won't be the case in the demo. It's only happened a couple of times. Um, but just to prove to you, so again, if we go to the container in the public endpoint, I can't get in. But if I switch to my VM, so I'm inside my VM now. Um, and if I go to my, just refresh this, go to my storage account and go to containers, you'll see that I can get in. So I have a fully working private endpoint and I can see my blob, yeah? And that wasn't too painful, was it? Once you know what you need to do, it's actually not too bad. Um, but because I've disabled all network access, public network access to this storage account, but I've only deployed a private endpoint for blob, this only works for blob. If I try access tables, it's not gonna let me in. So in one of the later demos, I'll deploy a table one as well. Um, but just important to note, if you're disabling public access on the resource, you're disabling it for all endpoints. So you need to think about which endpoints do I then need to deploy private endpoints for. Cool. OK, let's have a look at these questions. Um, if another VM outside of the VNet wants to retrieve the IP address of your private endpoint enabled endpoint, will it also retrieve the private IP address from the Azure DNS? And then the VM then are unable to reach the VM as no service has this IP address within its own VNet, or will the DNS somehow detect to not disclose? So that is entirely decided by the VNet link. Yeah. So normally you would have all of your private DNS zones in the hub VNet, and you would link your hub VNet to all of the private DNS zones. And because your hub VNet is usually where all your inbound traffic comes into, by default, anything coming in to the private network is able to use the private DNS zones to resolve everything. Normally, that's why private DNS zones are such important resources that you don't want to be giving access to anybody for, because they do contain your entire Azure Estates A records. It's, it's like a central DNS solution. So you don't really want to kind of be segregating access. It's kind of you want everything to be able to use those private DNS zones. Um, but certainly in your example, if you have another VM in another VNet, you would need to add another VNet link so that that VM can use the private DNS zone um, as well, if, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, the VNet link is there's the sole thing that determines what can use the private DNS zone and what can't use the private DNS zone. Hopefully that answers your question, but let me know if it doesn't. Um, Ah, hub and spoke. In case of hub and spoke network setup, is it enough to, you've li I literally preempted your question there. Yes. So yeah, for the most part, yes, you would add the hub um, and that would be, that would be sufficient for a lot of things. For example, if you're coming from, um, if you're coming from on-prem um, and you're on-prem you know, is connected via ExpressRoute or VPN and that's connected to the hub network, then having the hub network linked to the DNS zones will facilitate all of that access. But let's say you have a spoke VNet and let's say you have Databricks running inside that spoke VNet and you, you're doing VNet injection, so your Databricks clusters live inside that spoke VNet. Those Databricks clusters are also going to probably want to be able to resolve the private endpoint of your data lake, for example. And in that instance, the source of the query is coming from your spoke network. So your spoke network also needs to be linked to the private DNS zone so that anything inside the spoke can also resolve the IP address. Hopefully that makes sense. But certainly you would always want to link, link the hub as well. Feel free to ask any follow-up questions if you need to. Okay, so. We're at the hour mark, so I'll, I'll speed through a little bit, but obviously I'll probably go for the full 75 minutes as we've been answering questions as we go. Um, so I want to kind of show another example. So for this example, we're going to use the Key Vault. 
Um, you'll see that at the moment I can see my secrets. I've got um, allow all public access. So I'm going to go ahead again and turn that to disabled. Now, in this example, I'm going to replicate kind of a more realistic scenario as we've discussed. I am going to pretend now to be the central networking team and I'm going to deploy a private DNS zone for the key vault. Um, and I just cause I want to show you kind of what this looks like. But in this example, we're kind of going to pretend that this this private DNS zone already exists. OK, so I'm going to go to that link and I'm going to search for key vault to find out what the name of my private DNS zone needs to be, which, again, you probably won't be the one deploying this. But just so that, you know, you might want to ask the networking team, do we have a private DNS zone called this? Um, and that's literally all the information that you need to supply when creating a private DNS zone. So we'll go ahead and create that. And whilst that's deploying, I'm going to go back and create my private endpoint for my key vault. So we're going to come back to the private endpoint connections pane. We're going to click create. I'm going to give it a name. And um, you'll see that for key vault, it does not figure out the resource, even though I created the endpoint from the resource, I still have to go through and actually select it, which it doesn't do that for storage account, but it does for key vaults. Don't know why. So step one, we're deploying a private endpoint. Step two, we're selecting the resource that I want to link it to, which is this demo key vault resource. And then step four, step four, step three, <laughs> help me back at count. Uh, step three is the target sub resource type. Now for key vault, there's only one. It's vault. So it pre-populates that for us. And then step four is we need to tell it the virtual network. So hopefully you're sort of getting familiar with these steps now. Um, now on to uh, DNS. Now it should. No, oh, that's a bit annoying. It's not. It's because I've not deployed my. Um, it's not recognized that my private DNS zone has been deployed yet. Um, let's just check that it's been deployed. Did I deploy it in the right location? Maybe I didn't. Let's create another one. Maybe I didn't hit create. <laughs> that was probably the problem. OK, I have to wait a second for that to um, to deploy, but essentially what I want to see here is I want this new to disappear because I want Azure to recognize that I already have a private DNS zone to integrate with. Um, so we might just have to wait a couple of seconds for that to deploy. It's quite a simple resource, so it shouldn't take too long, hopefully, and we'll keep going backwards and forwards until that disappears. There we go succeeded let's see i might need to restart this or maybe do that definitely got the right name okay let's restart this um creation we've definitely got the private uh dns zone there okay let's skip through this quite quickly then to get back to where we were before Key vaults, key vaults. Oh, it's being very slow. There we go. Network, network. There we go. Okay, so you see how the new has disappeared, and that's because um, it's recognized that I already have a private DNS zone. So slightly more realistic situation than before. So in this situation, we're basically saying, well, my networking team has already set up my private DNS zones for me, so I don't need to create them, but I'm going to integrate with them. Still not fully realistic because in reality, you probably won't have any access <laughs> over these private DNS zones, and we'll cover that in the third demo if we have time. Um, but we're still going to tick yes, and I want to just highlight uh, an important difference between doing it this way and the way we did before. So just to summarize the difference between the two approaches, in the first approach, we didn't have a pre-existing private DNS zone, so we created one as part of the private endpoint deployment. Uh, in this example, the second example, we pre-created the private DNS zone and then 
upon deployment of the private endpoint, we're integrating with that pre-existing private DNS zone. So that's the difference between the two. And if I'm very impatient when it comes to deployments, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, so we can see that our private endpoint has been deployed and it's been added onto our key vault. If I go and have a look at it, I can, um, oh, that was the wrong thing that I clicked. This one. Uh, if we have a look at the top, you can see again, we can check uh, steps two, three, and four to check that we configured them correctly. Again, I'm going to head to the DNS configuration pane and I can see that an A record has been added for me. I can go to the private DNS and resource and check the A record there if I have access. Um, however, if I go to the virtual network link setting, the key difference here is that it did not create a VNet link for me. And the reason I believe why it doesn't do this is because we weren't performing a deployment activity on the private DNS zone. And that's only really a setting that can be added as part of a deployment activity. So again, just a tiny change in the way that things happen means that a crucial part of our seven steps is missing. And that's why it's so easy for these things to not work and not know why. So it's really important to know each of the different seven things that you need to check. Um, because I guarantee if you check all seven of those things and they're all working, then your private endpoint will be working. So I'm going to go ahead and add a VNet link. Um, they always have random names. Um, and yeah, simple as that. Again, in reality, you'll probably be asking your networking team to add this VNet link for you. Um, and when this VNet link is added, hopefully if the DNS has refreshed, we should be able to see that we can now get into our key vault inside our VM. So the it's, it's still provisioning it there. But again, I'll just show you um, if we go to secrets here, because I disabled public access, you are unauthorized to view these contents. You are not coming via an approved private link. Yeah. Um, so that's been created and fingers crossed that DNS persists in time. If not, we might have to check on it a bit later. Yeah, so that's updated. So you can see I'm inside my VM now and I can access my secrets, whereas outside of my VM, I can't access my secrets. If I was missing that VNet link, I wouldn't be able to get in. So just a small thing, but it would break it completely. So the final version of that I want to show you is essentially, again, we're going to pre-create a private DNS zone mimicking the fact that our central networking team is going to have a set of private DNS zones for us. And in this instance, I'm going to do it for uh, the table endpoint of my storage account. So a different endpoint, different service. So we'll go ahead and create that to start with. OK, uh, and whilst that's deploying, we'll have a look at our table endpoint. Um, Yes, this can all be set up with infrastructure as code. Um, but crucially, if you don't, if the service principle that you're using to deploy your infrastructure as code, um, if that service principle does not have permission over the hub environment, you likely won't be able to do the A records and the VNet links. So in a lot of the deployments that we do, we, we remove the A records and the VNet links from the infrastructure code. And that's a manual step that we have to request that from the central networking and infrastructure team because they don't like to give service principles at that level of access over their central networking infrastructure. But certainly it is possible, yeah. We do it via Terraform. Um, so if I go to the storage account and go to tables, you'll see that I can't get in because we disabled all public access and um, I haven't yet created a private endpoint. So let's go ahead and quickly deploy a private endpoint. And I apologize for going a bit quick on this. I do just want to make sure we have time to go through the common mistakes section at the end. Now, the most realistic, um, so we can click table here. The most realistic scenario is you won't have 
visibility at all over the private DNS zones. And so what will happen here is that you know you have a private DNS zone because you've asked your networking team, they've said, yep, we have that private DNS zone. But what will happen is it will still say new here and it'll say new because you don't have permission to see that private DNS zone. So you don't have any awareness of it. So likelihood is you'll need to tick no, which is exactly the scenario that I just described um, there with the infrastructure as code. You know, you could integrate it if you had permission, but you probably don't. So you, you're probably going to have to remove that step from your deployment process, whether that's a manual deployment process or an infra as code deployment process. And that's going to have to be a manual step that needs to be performed by the networking infra team. So unfortunately, that's probably the most realistic setup. So we know we've covered steps one to four here, and we know step five is covered because we've confirmed it with our networking and infra team that that private DNS zone exists. But at present, we haven't got step six and we haven't got step seven, which is the A record and the VNet link, which are crucial components. So in reality, what happens is you deploy your private endpoint and that gives you a private IP address. You then need to provide that private IP address and the name of the, the, the storage account or whatever it is, the, the name of your resource to the networking and infra teams, and they will be able to add an A record for you. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. So if we head to the storage account, we should be able to see that we have um, another one. We have a table one. Um, if we go to the DNS configuration, you'll notice that that bottom bit is empty because we have no A record. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the private DNS zone that I set up. And I'm going to pretend to be a networking and infra team now. And I've been given this IP address. So I'm going to create a record from in here, pop the IP address in there. Oh, there's a space. Uh, and then it will construct the fully qualified domain name for me based on the name of the resource. So I just need the, oh, the name of the storage account, which I have written here. Name of the storage account. It'll create the fully qualified domain name for me. And it's as easy as that. It adds the A record. Now, an important thing I want to point out is, unfortunately, if somebody adds an A record in here, what you'll notice is if I refresh this, it does absolutely nothing. And that's really annoying. Um, basically, if this page is empty, you might have an A record, you might not basically you can't tell and that's really annoying so if you do have something in this page you know for sure you have an a record but if it's empty it's not so clear cut so you might have to ask can you check the private dns this private dns zone for an a record for this resource with this ip address you might have to check that now what i would um yes exactly shrouding as a record both exists and doesn't exist at the same time um what I want to show you is another way around of adding the A record. Now, a lot of networking and infrastructure teams don't want to have to do this because it means going around all of your resources and adding it there instead of just adding them all in one central place. But if you have a nice friendly networking and infra team and they're willing to do it, I would definitely recommend asking them to create the A record on the other side. So instead of creating the A record in the private DNS zone, so I've deleted it from there, um, go to the private endpoint resource itself, go to the DNS configuration pane and add the configuration from here. This needs them to do it because if you try to do it, you won't be able to select the private DNS zone, right? Because you probably won't have permission. So you need someone who has permission to see the correct private DNS zone. It'll recommend the right one based on the type of private endpoint. And that's literally it. You click add. And so what this means is you now have the DNS configuration on this page, which gives you peace of mind that you have an A record. And it's just really, really helpful for debugging purposes. So that's now there. And if you go back to the private DNS zone, it's also added the A record there. So just something to be aware of. Again, we, we haven't done anything with our VNet link, so we need to make sure we add a VNet link as well. Again, you would ask your networking team to do this for you. And once this is added, we should be able to only access the table endpoint from within our private network. Um, so just to show you again, if I go back to my storage account and try go to tables, I can't get in from here. Once this virtual network link has finished deploying, we should be able to see that I can get in from. Fingers crossed the DNS is on our side and that it's updated quickly. 
let's try. Tables, and there you go. I can see my tables from inside my VM. So we've deployed three different private endpoints there, three different ways. You can see how it's easy to miss things, um, especially with all of the permissions issues and stuff like this and the responsibilities being split across different teams. So if you know you need those seven things for every private endpoint, it's just a really good checklist if anything's not working to be able to go through and make sure you have all of those things. But like I say, you might have to ask someone else to check some of those things for you if you don't have permission. So I'm conscious that we're kind of at the end of the allotted time. Am I OK to keep going for another 10 minutes if if that's OK with the organizers? For me, it's fine. Yeah. Obviously, if anybody does need me to, I won't be offended. <laughs> I've talked a lot tonight. Um, so there was just two things I wanted to touch on quickly. Um, basically, I've talked a lot about centralizing your private DNS zones, but there is a, a very good reason why you should do that, and I want to talk about why. And then secondly, we have touched on this kind of middle option of using the public endpoint, but you know, having that option of selected networks only, um, and why I don't like that. <laughs> um, so non-centralized private dns zones what happens if you don't centralize your private dns zone so let's say we have a hub environment uh, with two different spokes and in the two different spokes you've got two different uh, you know teams developing two different solutions two different platforms but they both happen to be using a lot of the same components they both want to use private links so they deploy a bunch of private endpoints for their resources They've seen my talk, so they know they need private DNS zones. So they both go ahead and deploy their own sets of private DNS zones in their own environments. Now, because they're both using the same types of private DNS, uh, private endpoints, they're going to have the same types of private DNS zones. So there's going to be a private DNS zone in spoke one called private link.blob.core.windows.net. And there's going to be a private link in spoke two called private link.blob.core.windows.net. Now they know they need a VNet link for their individual spoke networks because they know they're probably going to want to resolve their IP addresses from within their spokes. So they go ahead and add VNet links respectively onto their uh, individual private DNS zones. Now, at the moment, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. This will work. The problem is when you have this hub and spoke setup. Now, as we've touched on already, it's likely that you're probably going to want to resolve some of these services from on-prem, such as a user connecting via their, you know, their local laptop via the VPN, or maybe some on-prem services like an on-prem self-hosted integration runtime for Data Factory. They might need to resolve your private endpoints. All of that comes into the hub, so the hub becomes the source vena of that query. You might have other things in the hub as well that need to be able to resolve these private endpoints. You might have shared compute in the hub that you're using for things such as Azure DevOps uh, self-hosted build agents. Now, VNet links don't respect peering, VNet peering. So just because you've got the spokes VNet linked, it doesn't extend via the peering to the hub. You would need to add an additional VNet link, as we discussed, for the hub network. Now, what happens here is you can't do this. Um, the reason why you can't do this is whilst you can have one type of private DNS zone with many, many VNet links, that's OK. What you can't have is one VNet connected to more than one of the same type of private DNS zone. That's not possible. So in this scenario, you have one VNet, which I've tried to have highlighted in red here, the hub VNet, and you want to link it to more than one type of the same DNS zone. You want to link it to the blob DNS zone over here and the blob DNS zone over here, and that's not possible. So what happens is this becomes um, a race, <laughs> and whichever spoke does it first gets that VNet link, and they've captured all of the hub connectivity for themselves, and no one else can use those private DNS zones or no one else can resolve anything from the hub, basically, which is not what you want. So whilst, yes, you, there's nothing stopping you from having non-centralized private DNS zones, if you're in a hub and spoke topology, you will very quickly run into this problem. Um, ah, sorry, I feel like I've missed someone's question there. Yes, I'll come to that at the end if that's OK. Sorry for missing that. Um, so yeah. That's basically my argument, or, or ba well, it is in the documentation, but it's not super clear. Um, so instead, you have all your v DNS zones in the hub, and you just link as many VNets as you need, including the hub and any spokes that you need, and everything will work fine. <laughs>
So just a word of warning with that one. Secondly, I wanted to address this option here. You will have seen it in the demo when we were looking at this firewalls and virtual networks pane. So there's this section called public network access. And in the demos that we looked at, um, I had enable from all networks originally, and then we changed it to disabled. But what we didn't explore is this middle option, enable from selected virtual networks and IP addresses. Now, crucially, this option is underneath a title called public network access. So all we're doing here is saying, still allow things in from the public endpoint, but restrict it to certain virtual networks and IP addresses, which is, as we discussed earlier, more secure than having no restrictions. But so many times I have seen people do the following. They want to deploy a private endpoint, so they go ahead and deploy a private endpoint. They don't realize that they need the other bits, the A records, the VNet links, so they forget about those. They try to connect to their private endpoint. It doesn't work. They come to the networking pane of their resource. This is the first page they see. They see that menu at the top and go, ah, enable from selected networks. That must be what I'm missing. So they tick that, they put their VNet in, voila, they can access their endpoint. And they go, brilliant, my private endpoint's working. So then I come along six months down the line reviewing their resources and I go, I thought you were using private endpoints. Why do you have enable from selected virtual networks selected? And they go, well, I needed that for my private endpoint to work and I go, no, that, that's related to public network access. If your private endpoint is working successfully, you can go ahead and set that to disabled. And they're always very scared to do that. So they go ahead, they put it to disabled, and obviously everything breaks. I get blamed. <laughs> um, but that highlights that the private endpoint was never working. Now, if you do have a successfully configured private endpoint, and then you enable this as well, it will use the private endpoint. So it's not an issue from that perspective. However, obviously you can see from the, the scenario that I just talked through how misleading this can be. So if you want to test that your private endpoint is definitely working, you need to set this to disabled. Or if you want to sit and actually monitor the network logs and look at the IP addresses, but that's less fun. Um, so it can be really, really dangerous um, to have this on, especially if you're telling everyone that your data platform is protected by private endpoints and actually it's not, everything's going through the public endpoint. So just a huge thing to watch out for because I've seen this so many times. You don't need to go anywhere near this if you're using private endpoints. You can use this as well, but note that it's entirely separate. It's not related to private endpoints at all. Okay, so conscious that we're way over. So that's everything I wanted to say about that. Um, there is, as I said, a blog post that I've written, which is basically a summary of this talk. I split it into two blog posts. So there's an introductory blog post and then a blog post just focusing on the seven steps, which is the one I've linked. And then I also put the link to the Azure private DNS zone names, but I think um, that has been put into the chat as well. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening.